Good morning. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 11, we'll read just one verse this morning. Acts chapter 11, verse 23. And we'll read this from the King James Version, the authorized version. It begins like this. Who, meaning Barnabas, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. We'll read that again who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, this thing was his exhortation, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we are once again thankful we could gather in this simple way this morning and break bread and remember you. How precious our time in your presence is. How it strengthens us. How grateful we are. We can gather with brothers and sisters in your presence and remember you. Now, Lord, as we turn to your word, we're again expressing to you our utter dependence that you would speak to us something of value. Again, I say it often. You alone have the words of eternal life. Your words are spirit and life. And unless you speak, Lord, there is no value. So we call upon the Holy Spirit to quicken us as we are listening and to quicken us as we're speaking that we may hear words from above that direct us to our Lord Jesus once again. For we ask it today in the precious name of the Lord. Amen. Well, I suppose, at least those of you that were here last week, remember how we began a message from this 11th chapter of the book of Acts, from verse 19 to the end to verse 30. And it was simply called Antioch and Barnabas. But the burden was in the subtitle. As I said, the subtitle was the movement, the man, and the message. Now we've shared on those first two parts already and today what we'd like to focus on by the grace of God is the message. Now if you were here you remember me sharing about how when I was preparing for another message for another place I stumbled across this verse in my preparation 11 23, and it hit me like a bolt of spiritual lightning. Now, I know you've had those experiences when all of a sudden the word of God is illumined and you see something in it that you've never seen before and it becomes rhema, the living word of God. I know you've had those experiences if you're with the Lord. And it has continued, as I said last week, it has continued to be like peals of thunder reverberating in my heart. Even when I was sharing about something else, I kept thinking about this one verse, that with purpose of heart we would cleave unto the Lord. So this is where we'll be going today. Last time we talked, we mentioned the context and how we saw in the context all these three things. God's moving. How God was able to move in the most difficult times. His sovereign movement when he moved in Antioch to raise up this expression that eclipsed every expression and became a place where believers were first called Christians there in Antioch. We said how God is able to work in not only the most difficult times, but he moves in the most difficult places. And we talked about Antioch being a place of great resources, of great commerce, of great prosperity, yet of tremendous decadence. Even the Romans were ashamed of the decadence 
there in Antioch of Syria. And we talked about God did his greatest work in that place of darkness. And I meant that, brothers and sisters, just to be a little encouragement to us. You have to be thinking about our own country when you make those comments. Such prosperity, unlike any nation on the earth, such commerce, not yet eclipsed, but probably soon to be eclipsed by China. All the commerce, all the wealth, all the prosperity you could imagine as a nation, greater than any nation that has ever been. And yet, in the middle of this nation, deep and dark decadence. You can't imagine. You look around, you read the newspapers, things you couldn't have thought of 20 years ago, 30 years ago, a generation ago, 40 years ago, that we would be talking about as liberties, things we couldn't imagine that would be brought out in public discourse are now upon us. And yet, the encouragement is God can use in these darkest, of pl God can move in these darkest of places. Then we talked about the man, for those of you that weren't here, I'll give you this brief introduction. I think we have a lot of lessons to learn from Barnabas. Barnabas, you don't see too much about in the scripture, but what you see is enough to learn some real lessons about the man God chooses and the man God uses to do his work. And I believe the spirit of the burden that was upon me is that God would raise up more Barnabases among us. We need more like this man. God is looking for a man not to do his work, as I said, Brother Nee, I think, said so profoundly, but to join him in his work and to be a co-worker. He's looking for a son of encouragement, what Barnabas' name means, a son of consolation. He's looking for an unselfish man. When you read about Barnabas, the thing you discover that stands out is he was an unselfish man. How unlike that it is in Christianity today. He is looking for one that will come in, not to be a critic, not to control, but to come in and come alongside the work that he's doing, to see the grace of God, to rejoice in the grace of God, and then to help the people of God to continue in that grace of his working. This is the kind of man I believe he's looking for. He is looking for ones that will lay down their lives for others. I believe that's evident with Paul, with John Mark. He always was one brother that laid down his life. And he's looking, this last little point, for a good man, not a great man. So often we have ambitions and aspirations to be something great in the house of God. I wish we could just dispense of those things. Whether it's regarding ministry or service and just give ourselves as one people to the grace of God and let him do the work he wants to do. Remember, he that will be the greatest among you must be what? The servant of all. That's the greatness we should aspire to. Well, you uh, get, I think that's pretty much a summary of what we have. Barnabas leaves a great impression that we should aspire to and make our prayer that we could be like this one. Now today we're going to look at this phrase, this singular phrase that it begins like this, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. This is not a very long message, at least this message that we read there with Barnabas, but it is a profoundly deep message. And I believe this is not just the message for Antioch. I believe in the day that we live it's the message for the people of God that we with purpose of heart would cleave unto the Lord. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Three things I've broken down. First of all, with purpose. Now, some of you would, would, would 
rather enjoy that we move on from talking about this so much. But we can't stop talking about purpose. If we're not a people of purpose, if we're not focused, if we don't see why we're together, then what will we be? Will we be that testimony of Jesus like Antioch was? You know, it it seems to me that the people are so critical of us using this word, don't even understand the significance of this word in the scripture. It's all over the place. What God is after, first of all, as a God of purpose, is a people of purpose. And those that see his purpose and those that embrace his purpose, he will use to express in their lifetime the testimony of Jesus Without purpose, it goes without saying, we are purposeless. We have no purpose. The famous Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle said this, the man without purpose is like a ship without a rudder. Now you've heard that. Well, my goodness, they use it on every uh, managerial poster you can find now. You walk through office places and you see dear old Thomas Carlyle, this ancient Scottish man, his historian, and his saying emblazoned on the walls, without purpose, we're a ship without a rudder. That's what Thomas Carlyle said, but he said more. We're waif, a nothing, a no man. Have purpose in life and having it throw such strength of mind and muscle into your work as God has given you. That's what he said. Brothers and sisters, we should throw our whole heart and soul behind the purpose of God. There shouldn't be any sort of anemic response to the purpose of God. But if it has grabbed us and laid hold of us and claimed us for his own, we should throw behind it heart and soul. And that's what this little phrase means with purpose. You know, this would be good natural advice if I were talking about natural advice if you don't have a purpose in your life what are you doing you'll never meet your goals have purpose with purpose even in the daily living have purpose it's those without purpose that fail it's those that with with purpose and give their energy to that focus that succeed in what their goals are to be. Now, that's natural advice. I'm not here to give you a a pep talk. But I believe with purpose is much better spiritual advice. So this is the message, I think. Many of us, you know, have testified that before before we met the Lord, we had a life without purpose. You know, always the question is why? Who are we? What are we about? I think atheists must be the most depressed people in the world, although they put on a pretty good show, with authority as if they think they know what they're talking about. But good grief, what hope is there? There's nothing left. It's you for those short moments of life, and then you are gone. And there was no purpose. There was no reason. There was no why. Believers ought to be the most encouraged people in the world. We ought to be a people with purpose. But you know, when we, I know it was, must have been your experience. I know it was my experience when I came to the Lord that night, when I came to, that Lord, to the Lord February 4th, 1972, and I met him in such a dramatic way, and I fell on my knees in tears, and his presence bathed me like nothing since. I remember that night like it was yesterday. I remember all of a sudden there was purpose. There was a reason. I knew something greater than myself, bigger than myself, a reason, a purpose, a focus for life. That's the difference. Millions of believers can testify that that was when the change was made, when they accepted the living Christ. Their life was transformed, and all of a sudden they discovered purpose. Now, before that, life is all about you. 
And I know Linda will be rolling her eyes when I say this, so you can look at her and I won't. It's one of my favorite stories, often repeated, she might say. I remember leaving a meeting one Sunday morning, driving home, and this dear young girl in her car, and on the back of her car, that bumper sticker, I am the center of the universe. And I thought, good grief. I fought it, but I would never say it. And I would never put it on my car for everybody else to read and believe that was me. But when you're an unbeliever, you are the center of the universe. It's all about you and your life. It's all about you and your world. That's your purpose. I remember the other morning going to work. Hugh Joyce, this is not advertisement, by the way, but for... James River Heating and Air Conditioning. Thank you. Send your check to me, please. Hugh Joyce was on the radio one morning, and he was talking about restoring the old theater in Ashland, Jerry's hometown. And he said, Ashland, the center of the universe. And I said, good grief. <laughs> little sleepy town 15 miles up the road. You blink and you're through it. But, you know, they do actually call it that. I went to the Hanover Ashland Information Center, and they said, affectionately known as the center of the universe. Jerry, did you know you lived in the center of the universe? <laughs> I met my wife when she was living in the center of the universe, the love of my life, still the love of my life, next to the Lord Jesus. But it's all about us. It's I. We are the center of the universe. You are the center of the universe. Our world is the center of the universe. Everything is revolving around us. Good grief, the whole solar system is revolving around us. It's all for me. And then, by the grace of God, something changes when we meet the Savior. He becomes the center of the universe. He becomes the purpose. He becomes the focus. He becomes everything. And all things change from then till now. Thank God he upsets our universe. Thank God he came into our sphere and our realm. And those that have met the living Christ know something of him upsetting and turning our universe inside out. And when it happens, we'll never say we or our world is the center of the universe again. Brothers and sisters, this is what with purpose means. I had a funny thing to say to you, Jerry. There's this author, Paul Greenberg, that took real uh, exception to Ashland being the center of the universe. And he said, he wrote an article, don't go there. And he stirred up all of Ashland, Virginia. And he said, unless you can chart the entire universe and pinpoint Ashland, this city's claim to be the center of the universe has its flaws. And if true, listen to this, and if true, then God has a wicked sense of humor indeed. So much for us being the center of the universe. Brothers and sisters, the exhortation of Barnabas the Apostle was with purpose. We come into that purpose when we're saved. We we gradually, as we grow in Christ, discover more and more of the unfolding riches of that purpose. And that is the reason for living. I cannot think of a greater reason for living than this. Now, I'm going to read these verses. Some of you have already grown tired of hearing, but please turn with me to the book of Ephesians. And you'll see how great this purpose is. And you'll see what this purpose is about. It begins in verse 9. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 to verse 12. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. Isn't that precious? 
having made known to us the mystery of the will, of his will, according to his good pleasure, listen to this, which he purposed in himself for the administration of the fullness of times to head up all things in the Christ. That's the purpose. Everything in the Christ the things in the heavens and the things upon the earth, in him, in whom we have also obtained an inheritance, being marked out beforehand according to the purpose of him, not our purpose, who works all things according to the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who have pre-trusted in the Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is the purpose. It's all about Christ. It's only Christ. As a matter of fact, when you read the word purpose in English, when you read it in the New Testament, it is a singular word. It's never a plural word. You don't read in the New Testament the purposes of God. It's either the noun, the purpose of God, or it's either the verb purposed, but it's not purposes. Do you understand the difference? That's why this revelation that came to the Ephesian church was so tremendous. He saw they finally came into what God's full heart, the mystery that had been hidden all this time through the centuries, through the ages, that mystery began to be unveiled and that mystery was the person of the Lord Jesus himself. This is the greatest discovery. This is the greatest discovery. We need to be very thankful, brothers and sisters. I was meditating the other day. Why I'm here. How did that happen? It's surely it's the sovereign grace of God. Why you're here. How did that happen? Surely it's the sovereign grace of God. And one day he puts you among believers who understand his purpose and who hold to that purpose and cleave to that purpose with all their heart. To me, that is the greatest mercy. I don't know how it happened. I came to know this brother Stephen years ago. I just know God made it happen. And that is his sovereign moving. But now that it's happened, I'm so thankful that he didn't leave me in some sort of self-centered Christianity that was all about me. It was all about my world and everything revolved around me, even in the Christian life. Now, I know you know people like that. But thank God for his sovereign mercy. Brother Sparks said this. What a man of purpose he was. He said, it is of immense help in contemplating the manifold activities and energies of God to be able to gather everything into one inclusive, comprehensive, and concrete issue. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation, to the Revelation, uh, covers a wide range and includes a vast amount of matter. But it has one all-governing and conclusive objective. The purpose of God is one, he said. It is Always one, he said. It is always referred to in the singular. That confirmed what I saw. Here this brother that knows so much more than I'll ever know discovered the same secret. And he said this, and what is the one single comprehensive purpose The answer is his son, Jesus Christ. That's it. Simple as it is. Aren't you grateful it's not calculus? Aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful it's not physics? It's so simple. It's the Lord Jesus and everything in him. Now that is alone with purpose. That is what Barnabas meant to say, and that is what Barnabas 
had on his heart. But he doesn't stop there. Look at chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Now, I know you know these verses because we have just spent some more than a year, isn't it, in Ephesians? The jury doesn't remember. But uh, that's okay, brother, I don't either. Chapter 3, uh, verses 8 to 11. Listen to what Paul said. To me, less than least of all the saints, has this grace been given. That's what I mean, brothers and sisters. Grace has been poured out on us that we should know these things, that we should see these things, that these things should take hold of our heart and our being. Has this grace been given to announce among the nations the glad tidings of the unsearchable riches of the Christ and to enlighten all with the knowledge of what is the administration? Now, in King James Version, this is when I become like Jerry, that is fellowship of the mystery. I like that. The fellowship of the mystery is what we've been called into. Hidden throughout the ages, brothers and sisters. Hidden throughout the ages in God who has created all things in order that now to the principalities and authorities in the heavenlies might be made known through the assembly or the church the all various wisdom of God according to the purpose of the ages. With purpose. Think of that. Not only does this great purpose, it's all about Christ, but somehow in his mercy, he includes us in his purpose. Isn't that grand? Sometimes when I'm thinking about it, I could barely take it in. That he who is all sufficient and the center of God's universe has somehow taken that purpose and that purpose has included us brought us into it. And his desire is that one vessel out of all the men and women, out of all the universe, out of all the angelic beings, one vessel, the church, would be the expression of the all various wisdom of God. It's almost too much to take in. That's what Barnabas meant with Oh, brothers and sisters, how we need to see that. But look, in another place, that's not just it yet. Look at Romans 8. I know all of you know Romans 8, and I hear it often quoted. But look at Romans 8, beginning in verse 28. But we do know that all things work together for good to those who love God, and listen to this, to those who are called according to purpose. We often quote that verse, we do know all things work together for good. Brothers and sisters, it's not just general encouragement. It is indeed encouragement. But it's to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Listen to this, it's almost too much to take in. Because whom he has foreknown, he is also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. Those words weren't written by the Apostle Paul. You would attack me as a heretic. But this is the purpose of God. So great that he has called you and he has called me. And in the end, us as a testimony will be the expression of who he is. We will be conformed to the image of his son. We will never eclipse his son. It will be his son magnified with the many sons. It will still remain all about Christ. To me, that's what he meant. We are to be conformed to the image of his son so that he should be the firstborn among many brethren. But whom he had predestinated, these also he has called. And whom he has called, these also he has justified. But whom he has justified, these also he has glorified. Think of that. Every 
provision has been made for you and for me to bring us into the full purpose of God. And in the end, this greatest encouragement of all is that we will be conformed to the image of his son. That's what Barnabas meant with purpose. It's almost overwhelming. What a purpose God has for his son. What a purpose God has for his church. What a purpose God has for you and me. Listen to what 2 Timothy, the last letter of the Apostle Paul, he wrote to Timothy. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, who has saved us and has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, thank God, but according to his own purpose and grace which he has given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages of time. What a calling. I I know uh, you may be not too different than I am in this. When we think of calling, we often think of ministry and service. You know, someone says, I heard the call. Now, that's not wrong. But when God thinks of calling, that may be included But this calling is his purpose. That's what we're called to. You may have some certain ministry in that purpose. You may be used like Barnabas in a certain way, but our emphasis is never on the ministry and our emphasis is never on the service. Our emphasis is always on the purpose. Do you understand? I believe That was at the heart of this short message, with purpose. Now the second thing is another phrase, of heart. You know, this purpose is not somehow a cold and calculated and mechanical thing. First of all, this purpose is a heart thing. It's with purpose of heart. Unless we have our hearts in it, and not just our heads in it, we are, can I borrow the expression, heartless? You know, we often think of that as just extreme cruelty. But Christians can be heartless because they can understand things from a mental aspect. They can get things up here, but it never got down here. It never changed their life. They were never captured by it. Oh, sure, they can talk about it. They can read Ephesians chapter 1. They can read Ephesians chapter 3. They can read Romans chapter 8. But did it get us in the heart? Barnabas said, with purpose of heart. That's the key. Now, do you know, I know this is going to shock my brother Glenn. I know it is before I say it because I was thinking of you. When you think of key words in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, heart is one of the main words. I think it's 800 and some times. I think that's right. I wrote it down somewhere. 830 times. Love, would you guess? Love? Now, if I had to guess before researching, I would have said thousands. 2,000, 3,000, quite interesting, 310. I believe with God, it's all about heart. Where is your heart? And I think of that verse in Acts chapter 15 at the council of Jerusalem, the heart knowing God. You know that, you know that verse? In Acts uh, chapter 15, verse 8, and the heart knowing God bore them witness. He is after our heart. This purpose is to go into the heart. And with the affections of the heart, we are to embrace this purpose. You see this word heart countless times in Proverbs and Psalms. You see it when the Lord Jesus, you remember he often spoke about the heart. What did he say? Where your heart is, there your treasure will also be. What profound wisdom. 
He spoke of the heart. It was God's issue with the Hebrew people. He said, their heart is far from me. It wasn't their mind. It wasn't their intellect. It wasn't their understanding. They had memorized much of the word of God. It was their heart that he said was far from me. Brothers and sisters, this needs to get to our heart. Brother Nee said in the Lord my portion, the progress of our life hinges entirely on the transformation of our heart, whether it is hard or soft. And you remember those words in Hebrews chapter 3, 8 and 9, today, today. If you hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day of provocation when your fathers tempted me in the wilderness. You know that verse. Where your fathers tempted me and saw my works 40 years. With God, the issue is always the heart. From beginning to the end. It is always the heart. It will remain a heart issue. In our unsaved condition, the problem is our heart. We have a heart issue. Now, I don't mean you have a physical heart issue. Your ticker may just be fine. But when you're an unsaved person, you have a heart issue. You have a serious problem with your heart. Your heart is not functioning right, and your heart is, in fact, a hard heart. Um, you know, I was thinking of heart, and I thought and I was a young fella in 67, very young fella, and I heard about this first human heart transplant. Do you remember it in 1967 in South Africa, Christian Bernard, that famous surgeon? Well, he lived, that patient, not Christian Bernard, lived 18 days. Well, it was the first successful heart transplant. But brothers and sisters, God does a heart transplant in the believer, and you live forever. Do you understand that? He said, I'll take from you the stony heart and I'll put a heart of flesh in you and I'll put my laws in you. It's always and ever about the heart. One said this, when God measures a man, he puts a tape around his heart and not his head. Think of old Isaac Walton, another fella. God has two dwellings, he said. One is in the heavens. The other is in the meek and timid heart. How big the heart is. How important the heart is. Brothers and sisters, do you begin to understand why Barnabas chose this phrase? With purpose of heart. It's so important. May God capture and arrest our heart. You know, God has always been looking for men and women after his own heart. You know the story about David. 1 Samuel 13 verse 14 says, Jehovah has sought him a man after his own heart. In chapter 16 verse 7, when Saul was rejected, I think you know this verse, for man looketh upon the outward appearance, but God looketh upon the heart. That's the difference. He is seeking men and women like David that are men and women he can say that are after my own heart. Isn't that incredible? To say you are one after his own heart, I think, is a tremendous thing. And it says in Acts 13, 22, that's repeated, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all of my will. And it wasn't just his heart 
but it was a heart of purpose. When you read Acts, it says David served the purpose of God in his generation. Now, I know you've heard me say that before. I'll say it again. If ever there was a eulogy that meant something, if ever there was a memorial service where someone stood up and said something of profound significance, and they said in his generation, he served or she served the purpose of God. That's tremendous. How would you like that carved on your gravestone? It would be enough with purpose of heart. Well, you know, David's not the only one. I think of, uh, I think of Daniel. You remember Daniel? You remember how in Daniel 1 verse 8 it says, And Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not pollute himself with the king's delicate food. How many of us have that purpose of heart? How many of us have said in our spirit, have spoken to our soul and said, I have purposed in my heart not to pollute myself, with all these things. It's no wonder later in the book of Daniel, God speaks and says, Thou art one greatly beloved. That's the difference. May the Lord give us such a heart. I hope you're getting the connection. It's with purpose, but it's with heart. With purpose of heart is the key. Where your heart is is what matters. Does God have your heart? Is he the focus of your heart? I remember an old story about Sir Walter Raleigh. Everyone around here knows Sir Walter Raleigh. And the history teacher, you can correct me if I'm wrong, brother. Oh, he's from California. Those were the other explorers. But Sir Walter Raleigh, you know, of course, he came to the New World and he called this New World place Virginia. That's where we get it, after the Virgin Queen. And, you know, later, King James I condemned him to death. By the way, the one who authorized the King James Version. Good. <laughs> Sorry, Jerry. He condemned him to death. And the executioner said, Sir, which way will you lay your head? That's, that's a courtesy, I suppose. If the big sword is coming down and the executioner in the black drape says, Which way will you lay your head? That's some sort of mercy if you favor the right or the left. And this man, a Christian, Sir Walter Raleigh, who believed in the Lord Jesus, said, it matters not which way you lay your head as long as your heart is right. Do you understand? Is our heart right? Have we seen his purpose? Has it gripped us? Is it in our heart to such a degree that we say like David and like Daniel, we purpose in our heart. This is our purpose. Well, I, I think you sort of get it, and I'll probably be belaboring it too much if I say more. The last phrase, was that right from a historical perspective? Or you, uh, you're from California. I get it, brother. There's another phrase, I think, of equal importance, cleave unto the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't use that word cleave every day. You know, you don't walk around saying cleave to me. You know, it's just sort of maybe, we might think it's one of these old words, but it's a very, very important word in this message because you see, this relationship with God in his purpose of heart 
is not supposed to be this mechanical thing or even some occasional warmth, but it is to be a continuous cleaving unto the Lord. That's what he meant. I know Darby Version has an abide with the Lord, cleave, abide with the Lord, but I love the way King James puts it, cleave unto the Lord. Brothers and sisters, that's what we need to do. That was his final exhortation to the church. Now, do you know where that word cleave first occurs in the Bible? Do you know where it occurs? Yes, yeah, I could hardly hear. It's, it's my hearing this first it goes. It's right. In Genesis 2, 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Think of that from the beginning. This is the message. This is the clear message of Barnabas. From the beginning, it was God's heart that we cleave. It was never otherwise. And when you read, when you go through the Old Testament, you begin to see this word cleave again and again. As a matter of fact, more than the New Testament. Because from the beginning, when the law was given and God raised up a people, his desire for that people is that they would cleave unto him. Let me give you a few examples. I didn't write the verses down, but let me see if I can give you a few examples. I think Deuteronomy 10, verse 20. You can write these down and take them home. 10, verse 20. Thou shalt fear Jehovah thy God, him thou shalt serve, and unto him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name, He is thy praise and he is thy God who hath done for thee these great and terrible things. Let me read another one. 11, chapter 11, verse 22 to 23. For if you diligently keep all this commandment, which I command you this day, to do it, to love Jehovah your God, to walk in his ways and to cleave unto him. It isn't just in a few places this word occurs. You can see it in Deuteronomy 30, verse 20. You can see it in Jeremiah 13, verse 11. What God is after is a people that cleave to the Lord. This verse in Genesis chapter 2 is repeated again. In Ephesians that we've been studying, you remember Paul the Apostle when he was exhorting them about marriage in chapter 5, verse 31 and verse 32, he said the same thing. He said, and for this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall be one flesh. And then he said an extraordinary thing. He essentially said that's just not an Old Testament word. He said, I speak a great mystery, even Christ and the church. That is the kind of relationship, brothers and sisters, that is to define the church. It is to be a relationship, and I can think of no other word than that word, good word, than that word Jerry recently used, passion. Are we a people without any passion for the Lord? Is there a passion in our heart? Do we really cleave unto the Lord? That was Barnabas' exhortation. I happen to believe that was the reason the testimony of Jesus was so strong in Antioch. And I happen to believe if we had that same passion, the testimony of Jesus will also be strong among us. The problem is we lack that passion. I was reading some about Aiden Wilson Tozer, better known as A. Debba Tozer. Of anything you can say about this man, it is said about him, he was a man of passion above everything else. 
he was a man of passion. You know, he wasn't this great man that you, uh, you know, he, 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 he never finished high school, can you imagine, in the things he wrote. He, he was far from perfect, his biographers say, but he was a man of passion. They all agree. He was, an, let me put it this way, because I think this is what Barnabas is saying to us. He was an ordinary man with an extraordinary passion. Is that true of us? Well, this seems to be the thing. I know Brother Stephen once said to us, he heard Brother Tozer speak. And if I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, he said he was a prophet. Everybody had heard him thought, here is a 20th century prophet, a true prophet of God. But all agree that his exemplary characteristic above everything else was his passion for God himself. His biographer, Lyle Dorset, wrote, he had but one consuming passion. It was the pursuit of God himself. Can you imagine if that were said about you and me? It said, herein, another brother said, herein lies Tozer's enduring legacy. His passion to know God is still contagious. Tozer himself wrote in the preface to The Pursuit of God. You know that book, Pursuit of God? If you don't have it, order it. If you want me, I'll pay for it for you. Linda will kill me, but I'll pay for it. If you don't have it, it should be required reading. In The Pursuit of God, this man reveals what's in his innermost being, and that is a passion for God himself. It ought to be required reading for every believer that's going to cleave unto the Lord. He said this of himself. Quite a humble man, you might add. Others before me have gone much further, farther in the holy mysteries than I have done. But if my fire is not large, it is yet real. Isn't that a good statement? If my fire is not yet large, it is real. And there may be some, this is what he said, this was his hope. There may be some who can light their candle at its flame. That was his burden, his lifelong burden. With purpose of heart, cleave unto the Lord. I don't think Brother Tozer thought of himself as a great man. I think he was a good man like Barnabas. But I think he had a great heart full of passion for the Lord. In one of his writings, I don't know if it was near the end, I don't know when it was actually, it was an extraordinary phrase, it caught my eye, it said Tozer said this, I am looking for the fellowship of the burning heart. That's what he said. I am looking for the fellowship of the burning heart. He didn't care what you called yourself. As long as you were a Christian with that heart attitude, that was what he was looking for. He said this in that same statement. I believe it's an indictment of Christianity in our generation. He said too many, too many want to be entertained and amused. I'm afraid, brothers and sisters, much of what we call the church is an amusement park. We have light shows, and we have smoke and fog, and we have music that would rival any concert, and we have shows, and this and that. Now, believe me, I'm being somewhat gentle. Tozer had no use for that. I 
wonder, have we replaced entertainment and amusement with a burning heart? Have we replaced the burning? I'd got that backwards, didn't I? I know that sister, more intelligent than me, picked right up on that. Have we replaced that burning heart with amusement? Have we? This was, I believe, what Barnabas was saying. With purpose of heart, cleave. Well, that's the burden the Lord put on my heart. I know it's not complete, but I am convinced that there's something special about this message of Barnabas. Something for the church today. Something for the hour we live in to return to that purpose with heart, and to cleave to the Lord, I believe it's a message for the hour. May the Lord deliver us from just wanting to be entertained and amused as Christians. May God open our eyes to see his purpose, his great purpose. That's what with purpose means. May God deliver us from mechanical Christianity. And may we have be those of heart. And finally, may we be ones that are so caught up with the Lord Jesus that we too have a passion for him. I believe if that's true, the testimony of Jesus can be just as bright here in this little group of believers as it was in Antioch. And Antioch affected the whole world. May the Lord speak to our hearts. Lord, we know we often fail to communicate exactly what you want to say. But how thankful we are for the Holy Spirit that can take things and make them alive and real. Lord, we're asking today that you would make us this kind of people with purpose of heart that cleave unto the Lord. Lord, light that candle of ours so that it is burning with a passion for you And that we can say, like Tozer said, he is everything. We ask you to do that. We cannot. But Lord, you've whet our appetite for this. You've captured our hearts in some small way. You've been speaking to us by prophetic men of God about this for quite some years. We pray these words will not be lost, but be recovered. And we will be this kind of people. We ask it together in the name of our precious Lord Jesus.